This morning our reading comes from James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20. If you're in need of a Bible this morning, you can look to the aisles. Our ushers have those available for you. If you do not own a Bible at home, you can take that with you today. It's our gift. Uh, if you have one of those Bibles that were just handed out, we're on page 1013. And you can go ahead and follow along as I read. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's pray. God, we just give thanks for this morning, and we pray for Alfie as he just preaches directly from your word, that you would just give him all of the words that he needs uh, to, to give us this morning. We love you lots. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was just telling Colby this morning, I am so thankful that you read verses 19 and 20, because I'm supposed to be preaching from verses 13 to 20. And I figure I'll preach somewhere between 10 minutes and an hour. And so I'm hoping I get to those last two verses. But it's looking like it'll be more uh, through 18 if we're lucky. <laughs> so if you have your Bibles, turn to John. I'm in James chapter 5 is where we're going to be. And we're going to be, like I said, starting in verse 13. And uh, we're going to see that this verse or this, this section of Scripture is really speaking about prayer and healing. In fact, there are some debates about the healing, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, while you're opening up your Bibles, James, it's right after Hebrews. It's in the New Testament in case you're still looking. Uh, let me tell you a little story. When Ruby and I were in Texas, we were going to a church, a small little town uh, church, and on Christmas Eve, the whole town shows up. You know, you're one of the churches there. Um, it's not like here where, uh, you know, Christmas Eve, you could be going out to uh, watch, I don't know, a sports at a bar or something. No, there, everyone in the town is at the church, one of the churches. So we're at this church, and there is not even standing room. I mean, people are in the foyer, just, it's packed. And uh, the guy's giving a Christmas message like you would expect. And it's a small farming community. And during the message, about midway through, this elderly gentleman, gentleman, maybe in his 70s, gets up, and he starts walking up and down the aisle. David! David! Where are you, David? And I'm thinking, this is going to be great. Where's the pastor going with this? You know, I'm thinking it's part of the sermon. And then all of a sudden, you see the preacher looking at him, too, and just stops preaching. David, where are you? Here I am, Grandpa. This little kid raises his hand, get over here. And so that old man just picked that boy up, put him on his shoulders. And as he's walking out the church, the little boy says, pray for me, pray for me. <laughs> and then you heard him get a whooping outside in the, <laughs> in the foyer area. It was hilarious. I'll never forget it. True story. Prayer. How many times do we need it? Do we wait until we're in trouble? Do we wait until we are forced to our knees? Often that's what we do. But I want you to see here what James is talking about. James brings us full circle from where he began to where he's taking us. If you look at James chapter 1 where where. Mike brought us from way back when he started in James. James chapter 1, starting in verse 2. I'm going to read verse 2 through 4. Listen to this. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. And we've seen just in the last scripture that Mike was reading last week, the different trials that's going on where the rich were not wanting to pay the workers and the trials that the, the Christians are facing. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, 
knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. He brings us full circle as we now are going to open into chapter or verse 13 of chapter 5. He says, is anyone among you suffering trials, suffering? Then he must pray. Is any, anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. I want to show you some pictures, and I'm going to highlight, and you'll see where I'm going with this throughout this. This is my mom. She passed away in 2020. Uh, she was right before she got diagnosed with cancer. She got diagnosed July 28th, and before she was diagnosed, she would wear one of those red hats and meet all these friends of hers that would wear these red hats, and they'd go to the casino together and have lunch together, you know, all get on the bus. They'd go to Disneyland to go to the Carnation to go dancing, in case you didn't know, that's a, a dance place there for uh, the older generation. They'd go to Vegas together, and she was just full of joy, loved to be around people. She loved to have people at her house full of joy all the time. July 28th, she's diagnosed with colon, lung, liver, and brain cancer. Go ahead and show that next one. This is my wife praying with her um, just a few weeks after maybe into August, where she's praying because uh, when they gave us, when they talked to her, uh, you know, the, at the oncologist, they told her and my brother and my sister-in-law had gone with her to the, the doctor's visit, and they said, you know, with chemo and fighting it, you know, really aggressively, we're looking at three years. And I looked at the color of her skin, I saw some jaundice, and I told my brother, I said, look, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, but I've done a lot of hospital visits. And I'm telling you, me and my brother were off uh, on a trip together, you know, brothers river rafting. I told him, I tried to prepare him. I said, Joe, mom's not going to be with us that much longer. And he's, you know, starts tearing up. Don't say that. They said we got three years. And Joe, I'm trying to tell you, you don't have that much longer with mom. And go ahead and show that next one, if you would. This is our youngest daughter. She was here um, during the ordination. And you would think, you see how my, my mom, this is just a few days before she passed. You would think, well, wh why is she so cheerful? Let me get into the scripture. Is any among you suffering? Suffering, another word would be afflicted. Is anyone among you facing troubles? Is any one of you in trials? James is speaking to the experiences that they may have faced. Now some are going to tell you, some of the commentators, some of the scholars would say that this is not referring to physical illness. That this is talking about a spiritual uh, where they're, they're depressed or they are spiritually weary. And then others would say that this is exactly talking about a physical illness. But I, I don't think it matters whether we come to the conclusion that James is talking about a physical illness here or whether he's talking about a mental illness, or whether he's talking about a, a spiritual illness, no matter what it is, the answer is still the same. He says, are you suffering? Are you in trouble? Are you afflicted? Are you going through trials? Then you need to pray. If you look at verses 13 through 18, it is so important for us to be a church that prays. It is so important that believers pray that James mentions it 
in every verse from 13 to 18. In fact, if you were looking in the Greek, it's in four different, uh, he, he uses four different Greek words to describe prayer. It's that important that he wants us to know every verse. Pray, pray, pray. When you're suffering, when you're in trouble, when you're afflicted, when you think there is nothing else you can do, when your family is on the verge of their deathbed, what do you do? You pray. He says, the second part of that, so he says, is any among you suffering? Well, first, let me go back a little bit. I, I want you to notice that he says, among you. He, he, he says that in, in 13 and 14, and then in 15, he'll say, uh, any, let's see, let me pull it up, one another. He's basically saying all three times, he's going to say, among you, among you, among you. He wants us to know that this is for the entire community, that he's addressing the community. Hey, is there someone in your church? Is there someone in your family that is suffering? And the first one we see, it's the prayer by the person. The person realizes, hey, I'm afflicted. I'm in trouble. I'm suffering. I need to go to God in prayer. So they notice on their own, and they don't need to wait. They don't need to wait till Sunday. They don't need to wait to get one of the, the pastors on the phone. They don't need to wait to get the whole church involved. They drop to their knees there and say, I've got a need, and I'm taking it to the Father. Prayer by the person is the first thing. I want you, if you're writing it down, here's what we see in verse 13, is that he's singling out that the person is to go to God individually in prayer if he's suffering. And then he says, is any among you cheerful? Did you notice it's in the same verse? I think he wants us to know that too often we only pray when we are suffering. He wants us to remember that we need to have our hearts consumed with God in the bad times and in the good times. What was neat to me was when my daughter was with my mom, days before she was going home, she's cheerful. Because she is going over the memories that her and my mom have had together. She's reminiscing with my mom. They're going over stories and they're they're just enjoying the moment of spiritual connecting where family members like us get together and we lift each other up. I often say when someone is getting married and you should know that the church is the bride of Christ. When someone is getting married and the, the two become one, when they have a hardship, a trial, a suffering in their family, that trial, that suffering is shared between the two of them so that they don't bear the burden individually, but the two of them share that burden so that it is easier, it is lighter. They're able to make it through that together. And when they have a joy, they can, they can celebrate together. They can make it a party. They can remember that time, that celebration. They bring it Together to the Lord. That's what's going on here. He's saying, don't, don't just come to God when you're suffering. If you are cheerful, then sing praises. The word there is sing hymns. Play the harp. Make a joyful noise. Prayer by the person. The second part is prayer by the pastor's. Listen, start in verse 14. Is any among you sick? There we have that among you again. Any among you sick? Then you must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith 
will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. That first word, sick. Depending on where you're looking, it can mean to be weak, to be weary. Maybe they're talking about mental ability, you're, you're not thinking straight, you're depressed, your spiritual condition, you're, you're just going, God, why is this happening to me? Why, of all, I, I, I worship you, I, I follow you, I go to church, I do all these things. But if you look before the verses, in verse 10, he gives us some examples of the prophets. And the one I want to highlight is Job, because if you ever want to see a man who went through suffering, read the book of Job. Here's an example of the suffering and patience James brings to us when he's talking about the prophets. Job was wealthy, blameless, an upright man who feared God and shunned evil. He performed sacrifices not only for himself, but on behalf of his family. Job has all of his possessions and his children were taken by Satan. And Job fell to the ground and worshipped and did not blame God. Job is afflicted with some horrible skin sores. And his wife is, is, is trying to encourage him to just curse the God that you worship. He did this to you. Give him up. Yet, through it all, he would not curse or give up his worship of God. He continued to worship God. Some of the people that are being addressed in the community here, we see are going through a suffering and they are weak and they are weary, both physically and spiritually and mentally. That's what it means when he says they are sick. Is any among you sick? That's what he's talking about. Then the pastors. The, this is what I was saying. The, this portion here is the prayer by the pastors. The pastors, I just put that because it was another P, but it's the elders is what he's talking about here. But in 1 Peter 5 verses 1 and 2, what is the elder? Let me read to you what some of the description of an elder. Therefore, I exhort the elder among you, the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the suffering of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not for sordid gain but with eagerness. This is what the pastor is supposed to be doing. This is what the elders are supposed to be doing as they help the head pastor. They are supposed to be doing this type of work, watching over the sheep. When you have a sheep that has got caught in a wire or has a broken limb, who do they go to? What should be taken care of? Well, hopefully that sheep is brought to the pastor. So that they can mend the wound. Let's go through some of this part here. So then they call for the elders of the church. And they are to, here we go again. What are they supposed to do? They are to pray over. This is why one of the reasons I think this is actually a physical condition. And not a merely a, a spiritual condition. Here what I see going on from what I've read and just what's in the scripture is pray over. Here you have someone that is stuck in their bed, not able to get up. So the pastors, the elders, are praying over the lame man, the lame person who can't get up to go to the church to ask for prayers. They are 
praying literally over them. And I can see it in my mind, them holding hands or laying hands on the person as they pray over him, anointing him with oil. When I think of anointing him, I want you to see that here there are some different ways that the anointing can be used. One, it can be used as a medicinal act. And when I think of the medicinal act, I want you to know, go back in your mind to Luke chapter 10, verse 34. He says, and he went to him. Remember the the good Samaritan? He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on him oil and wine. Wine and oil because the wine would be the disinfectant and the oil because it had a medicinal property. I don't know what it was. I just know that's what they used it for. They used it for refreshment. When you'd come into the house and you'd been on a long journey through the dirt roads, what do we do when someone comes to our house? You come over, hey, would you like a cold water? Would you like a Coke? But back then in that area, what they do is they, they anoint your head with oil, your face with oil, so that you get refreshed. When I lived in San Francisco, we'd have a lot of hippies, I guess would be the best way to describe it, that would come in, and if I could be in Whole Foods, and I'd see the guys go over there, and they'd get oil from the salad bar, and they'd pour it on their hands, and put it through their dreadlocks. And I just asked one of the guys, hey, is that to help keep your dreadlocks looking nice? And he goes, no, it just feels good in the wind. (laughs) I don't know if it does or doesn't. I've never oiled my head, I guess. But it, it was used back then when someone came over to your house as a refreshing. It was also used as Uh, Remember in Mark 6, 13, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many sick people and healing them. Now, what happens when, I mean, I prayed, I had all of my church friends praying, my family prayed, and yet, My mom died. We're going to get to that. I want to show you another picture so I can continue to make this as real as possible about prayer and how important it is for the believer in the church to be engaged in prayer. Do we have that other picture? Okay, this is a family that I met when I went to Kentucky. That's Ni and his wife, Kim, and their two daughters. I don't remember their two daughters' names. My wife will. Um, So Kim, we're out to eat, the wife. And I'm talking about prayer because we're just all talking. Um, We're there with the search committee and the deacons, and we're talking. And uh, Kim says, oh, you want to hear a neat story about prayer, Alfie? And I said, sure. And so she tells me that her and Jenny... One of the ladies from the church were, had gone out to eat, and Jenny is married to the eye surgeon there in town. And so she said, hey, uh, Jenny, can you get me on Brian's appointment list for Monday? This was on a Friday afternoon. And she said, why? What's going on? And she said, well, this afternoon, uh, right before I came over here, All of a sudden, my left eye went blind. And she's like, what do you mean your left eye went blind? She says, I mean, it's blind. I can't see out of it. It's dark. And she says, well, that's weird. And she said, "Uh, why don't we have Brian look at it tonight when we go to dinner? Because they were going to go to dinner, the, uh, the, the two couples. And so at that evening at dinner, Kim brings it up, Brian. When we get done with dinner, can you look at my eye? What's wrong with your eye? It's blind. What do you mean it's blind? I mean, it's dark. I can't see out of it. So 
He asked Jenny, his wife, to go over with the iPhone and the flashlight and to cover one eye and to, to shine on it, and she couldn't see anything. And then he had her, you know, put some fingers. She couldn't see them. And he says, your eye's not dilating at all. And she goes, okay, what does that mean? He goes, uh, means we need to get the check and go to my office. So they got the check, went to his office, and he used his, you know, ophthalmology equipment and looked at it and said, uh, I'm going to send you in for an MRI. So she went in that right away, emergency, got an MRI done. And uh, when she got the disc, she brought it back to him. And Kim gave it to Jenny to bring back to her, Brian, to look at it. And uh, Kim and Nee, her husband, are waiting for them to come out. And Jenny and Brian, Brian says to her, I hope everyone's not getting confused with the names, but uh, Brian says, Jenny, this is not at all what I was expecting. This is bad. I'm going to go in there and explain to them what's going on. And we're going to need to comfort them, hold them, cry with them, and pray with them. And Jenny has no idea what he's seen at this point. So he goes in there and they start to discuss it. And she's got two large tumors. Uh, one at the front part of her brain and one at the back part. And so they, uh, they t tell her, well, we got to do emergency surgery. So they go in to do surgery, and they get one of the tumors out completely. The other one, it was, I don't know the word, the veins were growing through it, and so they, they could only get part of it. And so they were going to continue to do, treat it with chemo. And they told her that it was very unlikely that she would get her sight back in that eye. Um, they didn't even know if she would make it through the surgeries. And uh, vascular, that's the, it had become vascular, the tumor. And so she, well, she's telling me this, and she said when she came out of surgery, people are crying, and she's like telling them, quit crying. You know, I just need you to pray. I don't need you to cry. I don't need you getting all worked up. Just pray. Just pray. And she's telling me this, and my mouth is like, I mean, oh, my word, just I couldn't believe it. She's showing me the pictures, you know, of the tumor from the MRI. It's huge. It looks like a golf ball. And then she's showing me the scar on her head where she was shaved and this gigantic scar where they opened up her scalp. And, you know, you're just in awe. And everyone else that was in her family, in her community, in her church, everyone else is panicking. And she's comforting them, telling them, stop. Just stop it. I need you to pray. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that just brought a whole new level of prayer to me. I was just awakened, like the song, of what God can do through prayer. God healed her. Does God always heal does that mean that we have someone that you can call in the church that has the gift of healing? No, I don't believe that. Can God heal? If God so desires to give us a gift of healing, he will do it on his terms when he desires. But what happens when someone does not get that gift? Wait till the end of the uh, scriptures and you'll see. Here, what we see is they're anointed with oil. The oil, I believe, is a medicinal purpose. They, they brought it, the pastors. They knew that the, the person was sick in bed and they, they couldn't get up. So they called the pastors, the elders, to come to, to the person's house to pray over them. And they are using the medicinal oil to refresh that person, to give them hope, to give them a, a revived spirit. I remember when my mom was sick again, let me tell you. Ruby would bring tea tree oil because people would stop by unannounced, uh, like her friends, you know, all these red hat ladies would come over and just, hey, I came to see Martha. Well, okay, my mom, 
I don't know if you know it, but her generation, it's not like us where we just get up and throw on some slippers and a t-shirt. No, they, they want to look, you know, presentable. So my mom was very concerned about how she looked, and, you know, uh, my, my wife would get her ready, and she'd put some tea tree oil so that you wouldn't have any of the, the smells from the jaundice or anything like that. She'd refresh her. She'd comb her hair. She'd help her brush her teeth, get her ready, and bring her out. And it was really at that point, even though I'd been told before, it was at that point that I understood when people are that sick that you should make an appointment. To, you know, you should call them before just stopping by because um, for some of them, it's really that they want to look their best for you. They know that they don't look good and uh, they want you to remember them at their best. So they were anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. Restore. So what happens if the person is not healed here on earth? Well, that word restore means to make well, to save. The word there is sozo in the Greek. It means to have salvation, to enter into salvation, to be recovered from what ails you. Restore. So if we are not granted the gift of being healed from the illness here on earth, is that the end? Oh, no. That is not the end. Revelation 21.4 says, And He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. You see, when God designed us, when God created us, we, death was never a part of it. We weren't meant to suffer. We weren't meant to have this affliction that's in our lives because of sin. We weren't meant to go through this trouble. This is because of a broken world. And when Jesus comes again and he takes the dead first and then he calls up his children, there will be no more tears, no more death. No more mourning or crying. My mom is restored in heaven. That's what I believe what he's talking about there. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. So you are either granted the gift and healed here from the illness like Kim was. Or God takes you home. And he heals you there. So that you no longer have to face the troubles of this world. Then he says in verse 16. Therefore confess your sins one another. That's the other one I was looking for. He he said among you, among you, then one another. Again, one another. That's us. That's the community. That's the community of faith. The family of believers. He's saying that we are to be able to confess our sins to each other so that Satan does not hold this down with them. That's what he's talking about there. Confess your sins so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Can accomplish much. And then he gives us an example of what that looks like. Don't you love it when the writers like James give us an example, you know, the effective prayers of a righteous man. Oh, and what would that be? What does that look like? I'll tell you. Elijah. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Like ours. Finds himself in the same or similar situations. Whose attitudes or feelings is the same or similar to ours. He has like feelings to you and to me. He has like affections to us. He has a nature like 
ours. This is a man that didn't die but was called up to heaven. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the earth for three and a half years. Now that is some prayers. Can you imagine you're on top of Mount Car Carmel and you say, you know what, you don't believe me? I'm stopping the rain. I'll show you. It's not going to rain here again for three and a half years. So you pray. God, stop the rain. Let's show these people. Bam, no rain. God, they still don't believe me. They still don't believe that you are the God of the universe. I'm going to pray again, God, and I want you to make it rain so hard. So he prays again. God pours down rain that produces fruit. Man, oh man. That's the type of prayer that each and every one of us can have. Because Elijah is just like me and you. He has a nature like me and you. So what I want you to see is there's the prayer by the person that realizes they're in trouble. They're suffering. Or maybe they're cheerful because things are going so good. But they still go to God in prayer and they want to thank Him. They want to sing praises to Him. They want to make a joyful noise. Then there's the prayer by the pastors because the person is so lame and so weak and it just whether it's spiritual weakness that he's just almost given up that he has to call the church or someone from the church, maybe his wife, maybe a friend, says, hey, you need to go to Joe's house. He, he's, he's crying. He can't take it anymore. He doesn't believe anymore. Call the pastors. Call the Call everyone, let's start going over and praying for him. And then the prayer by the people. When you think, what, what can I do? I'm just one person in the church. You can pray because you have a nature like Elijah. You can pray just like him. All you have to do is believe. The first thing I want you to believe is we weren't created to go through this trouble and this suffering. This has happened because the world is broken. God, when he made this world, it was perfect. There was no sin. There was no suffering. There was no death. And then we messed it up. We broke this world so God said, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to send my son on a rescue mission because I want you. I want you. I want you to have a personal relationship with me. I want to be able to speak with you. I want to walk with you in the garden. So he sent Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life, faced the same temptations that we face. And Jesus went to the cross for us Paid a debt he didn't owe and a debt that we couldn't pay that we owed. He went to the cross for us. He died. They buried him. And on the third day, he rose again. Rose, restored. So that we can have eternal life. You have to believe. Believe. Not just with your head. With your heart, you have to trust in the promises of God and you have to make a commitment saying, I want to follow you the rest of my life. So in a moment, we are going to have an invitation and I'm going to make four rather than three invitations that our pastor usually does. The first one is for you to believe. I want you to believe in what Jesus did for you, for you individually, that he came on a rescue mission so that you could be restored. The second one is we're going to have the table open. 
And the Bible says every time we take the Lord's Supper that we are to do this in remembrance of Him. Remembering what He did. That His body was broken. That His blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Don't take that lightly. When you come to the table, come after you've prayed. Come knowing that you are remembering what Jesus did for you. The third one is I want you to feel free to come to the altar. I'll be up here. Anyone who wants to, pray for this church. Pray for your friends, your family, this country. Too often I think we are turned off by prayer. You want to see this church grow? You want to see this community healed, this nation healed? It starts with you. You have the same ability as Elijah by being a person of prayer. Don't be afraid to come up here and have people see you praying. And the last one, we were created to worship God. I want you to sing. That's the guys too. Sing, make a joyful noise. It might not be joyful for you, but it will be to God when he hears your voice. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that you give us an opportunity, the ability, Lord, to come to you in prayer, to just being able to open our hearts to you, Lord, that we're able to come to you whether we are suffering or whether we have praises, Lord. Lord, we thank you and we lift our hearts to you. Lord, I know there's someone in here that has heard the gospel that is needs to come and just get some, some more questions answered so that they can learn what does it mean to follow you. Lord, help that person to take a step in obedience and come down and ask, I want to follow Jesus. And for the rest of us, Lord, let us be a people of prayer, of believers in a church who realizes the necessity of prayer in our lives. Lord, help us to sing as we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen.